Okay, so uh, this afternoon we are going to discuss the philosophy of Saint Bonaventure, one of the important scholastic philosophers belonging to the Franciscan tradition. And normally when we talk about scholasticism, uh, we always highlight the Dominicans, uh, especially Saint Thomas Aquinas and Saint Thomas Gray. But uh, let's not forget that. Uh, Aside from the Dominicans, there are also great uh, Franciscan scholastics. And one of them is Saint Bonaventure. In fact, I would say that he's the foremost Franciscan scholastic, equal in stature to Saint Thomas Aquinas. Only that, I would say that Saint Thomas was more popular, precisely, maybe because uh, the Dominicans continued the their uh, scholastic tradition, meaning uh, they re really ventured into, into education, into teaching. And like the Franciscans who have branched out to different, you know, uh, different orders, uh, the, the Dominicans really have maintained just one, just one order. So when you say for the preachers, it's just the Dominicans. But the Franciscans, you have the Capuchins, you have the Reclex, you have the... You know, so there are many uh, other religious orders under the under the patronage of St. Francis. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's discuss briefly the life of St. Bonaventure. He, of course, the real name of St. Bonaventure is John Fidanza. And he is called the Seraphic Doctor. Doctor Seraphicus. If Saint Thomas is called the Angelic Doctor, Saint Bonaventure is called the Seraphic Doctor, uh, and he is the most illustrious among the disciples of Alexander of Hales. Studied under Alexander of Hales, he was born at uh, Bagdorea near Viterbo in the year 1221. So he is older by maybe four years uh, than St. Thomas. St. Thomas was born 1224 or 1225. Now, in 1238, St. Bonaventure entered the Franciscans, the order of St. Francis. And then after that, he was sent to Paris where he studied theology under the masters of that order, uh, notably, uh, Alexander Hales and John of the La Rochelle. And when these two masters, Franciscan masters, died, he continued his studies under Jude Ridgold and William of Meliton. Uh, William of Meliton figured prominently because, as we discussed, the, uh, the, the Summa Lishana, he was he's considered to be one of the co authors of the Summa. Then in 1248, Saint Bonaventure earned his Bachelor of Scripture, which allowed him to teach, to teach first in their convents and then later on in the university. So he began lecturing on the Gospel of Saint Luke, and then the other books of the Scriptures. His monumental commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard perhaps the most uh, perfect example of this form of medieval literature was composed between the years 1250 and 1252. So, of course, uh, during the medieval, the scholastic time, medieval era, everybody, it's a common practice to write commentaries. And so there is a commentary on the works of Aristotle, and there are commentaries on the scriptures. There is a com there are commentaries on the sentences of Peter Lombard. So everybody writes a commentary, and it's just called commentary on this and that. No? The Saint Thomas also wrote a commentary on many of these works, scriptures, the works of Aristotle, uh, the sentences of Peter Lombard, etc. So everybody writes this, you know, and everybody actually writes some kind of a summa. Uh, only that the Summa of St. Thomas became the really became very popular. It became the most uh, significant work 
during the medieval times. That's why when you say Summa Theologiae, we always think of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, in 1253, he was licensed by the Chancellor of the University of Paris and functioned as a Regent Master of Theology until 1257. So, um, the the careers of St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure almost parallel each other. During this time, he composed four sets of Costiones uh, Disputate, of which the Decentia Christi uh, on Christ's knowledge is important for his theory of illumination. And then the Mysterio Trinitatis, which contains the best exposition of his proof for God's existence, and the Caritate the novices on the charity and the last thing. So these are, so you can see here that Good Adventure, St. Good Adventure, is as prolific as a writer as St. Thomas Aquinas. So he produced, also produced so many, so many writings. Now, it was not until 1257 that St. Good Adventure made his solemn inception no, uh, as a, as a master, no? as a mas as a master of theology, no? uh, and and he he attained this uh, this this uh, degree or this title same year as Saint Thomas Aquinas, okay? and their formal reception to this master's guild, you know, the. Uh, the master's master of theology was delayed actually until October 1257 because of the controversy surrounding the mendicant fri friars and the secular masters. Uh, the secular masters they objected to the mendicant friars, you know, inclusion or reception into the master's guild. They, they objected to this. Uh, they questioned whether the mendicant orders, the friars, the Franciscans and Dominicans uh, are entitled you know, or deserving of, you know, uh, being formally received into the master's guild. But by the time, however, he was no longer actively teaching, I mean, uh, St. Bonaventure. In February of 1257, he had been elected minister, minister general of the Franciscan order and had resigned his chair at the university to devote himself to the admin, to administrative post. But just the same, he was received uh, into, that, uh, into that exclusive group of masters. So it was during these years, uh, 1257, that he composed the Brevi uh, is a short compendium on speculative theology. Uh, and of course, which was a departure from the usual scholastic method of presentation. He also wrote the Reductione Artrium, Artium Ad Theologiam on the reduction of the arts to theology, whose exact date, of course, of composition is not known except that it's it was composed or written around that around the time and the uh, journey of the mind to God the itinerarium meant is in Deo which was uh, published or completed in 1259 so again uh, it that exhibits the uh, prolific uh, the prolific writer in Saint Bonaventure now, St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas were employed by their respective orders to defend the mendicants against William of St. Amor, who, who challenged uh, their taking a position in the university. And from that moment, actually, of their first acquaintance at the Paris until their death, which they became really very good friends. No, I mean, well, there is a friendly rivalry between Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Bonaventure. And uh, both act died actually on the same year, 1274. Uh, 
only that St. Thomas died ahead of St. Bonaventure. And I think it was just three or four months that separate the death of the of these two great scholastic masters. So uh, they maintained a friendship in which they seem to rise above the spirit of rivalry that exists you know, between them, even at the time uh, between its, these two great, great orders. You know? So the, as I've said, there is a friendly rivalry between the two. They, they actually exchange letters. You know? Of course, the, it's, it's, uh, it's an exchange of letters about philosophy. So, one will write something and then the other will also reply back. St. Bonaventure was made uh, general of the Franciscans in 1257. That's why he had to leave his uh, teaching assignments and was raised to the dignity of Cardinal by Gregory the ninth or the tenth. St. Thomas was also offered cardinalship, but uh, St. Thomas declined this offer of the Hope to make him a cardinal. So Saint Bonaventure died during the Council of Lyons in 1274. Saint Thomas was also summoned to attend that council, but he died along the way. So he never made it to Lyons to attend this council. This Council of Lyons was actually uh, the, the purpose of that is to reconcile uh, the Eastern and the Western churches. You know, the result of the great is schism of the 11th century so he was summoned by the pope that this these are the two favorite theologians of the pope uh saint Bonaventure or saint thomas aquinas the two favorite theologians of the pope they were summoned to leons to attend this council aimed at re you know uh reuniting or reconciling the two churches unfortunately saint thomas did not reach you no know, did not was not able to attend that uh, that council. Uh, Saint Bonaventure was able to attend, he, but of course uh, he died during the the council itself. I think he died in uh, around June, if I'm not mistaken, June of 1274. Uh, Saint Thomas died uh, about March of that year, and March, April, May, June, yeah. Three, four months later, St. Bonaventure died and followed him in heaven. All right, so that's so much about the life of St. Bonaventure and his career. Now, let's uh, just to mention some of his important works. Uh, so these are, the, of course, the commentary on the four sentences, uh, the redaccione, then the itinerary of the mind to God, and then you have the Breviloquium, Soliloquium, the Regine Me Animes, the, uh, the Reign of the Animals. So some, these are just some of the important works of St. Bonaventure. I have already mentioned some of the works that he wrote uh, earlier. Okay. So now <clears throat> let's go to his philosophy in general. And of course, uh, we have to say that St. Bonaventure belonged to the Franciscan Augustinian traditions. So he was, he was, he was of course, following the tradition set by St. Augustine. But we also have to recognize that while he was faithful to the Augustinian tradition, he was not he was also familiar with the Aristotelian texts that were being studied during his time. I remember that he was a student of Alexander of Hales, and Alexander of Hales was actually one of the very first that studied Aristotle. So St. Bonaventure, while he followed the Neoplatonic tradition um, continued by St. Augustine, he was also well versed in Aristotle's philosophy. And not just about Aristotle's philosophy, he was also well versed or informed about the Arab philosophers. So just like St. Thomas, he have, he is familiar with the with the texts, with the philosophies of the time. Okay. 
Now, his, and this is, I think, where uh, we can draw some differences between St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure. St. Bonaventure's fame rests primarily on his reputation as a theologian rather than as a philosopher. Uh, St. Thomas, was, his reputation rests both on his being a theologian and being a philosopher. Of course, he was more of a theologian, but he was also an acknowledged philosopher. That's why we always study St. Thomas in philosophy. Uh, hardly we study Bonaventure in philosophy, unless we study a course like this, medieval philosophy, and we study his philosophy. You know? uh, sometimes, even if we study his classicism, still other people would not take his philosophy as, you know, and focus on his thoughts, on his philosophical thoughts. So the reputation of Bonaventure rests more of his being a theologian rather than a philosopher. In both Dante, Dante's uh, Paradiso and Raphael's Disputa, he appears as the equal of St. Thomas Aquinas. And in the field of mystical theology, he has been considered without peer. In terms of mystical theology, I hope I can talk about his mystical theology later if uh, we have time. Uh, <clears throat> it is more difficult, however, to isolate the philosophical components of his system, isolate it from his theology. So rather difficult because like Augustine, of course, Augustine is recognized as a philosopher and theologian, but also like St. Augustine, his philosophy and theology are fused, are really fused together. There's always an element of theology in his philosophy. Unlike in St. Thomas, that more or less you can see uh, a separation between fides and ratio, or between theology and philosophy, or faith and reason. But for St. for Saint Bonaventure, really, uh, it's difficult to separate the two components. And this is perhaps because of the prevalence of theological interests in all his writings, which could be attributed to his reaction against the rationalism that was rampant in the Faculty of Arts in Paris, that threatened the very reason, or the raison d'etre, of speculative theology. So there is this rationalism, this, this attitude of rationalism in the University of Paris, especially in the Faculty of Arts. Okay? So don't think of rationalism as being, you know, uh, again, very prominent during the modern era, because there was already a, you know, a kind of form of rationalism, even during the medieval era. This rampant rationalism actually led to the condemnations of in 1270 and 1277 by the Bishop of Paris, Stephen Tempier. And there are actually 219 items which were condemned, listed as theological errors in the second of these condemnations. And here are some examples of statements uh, against theology, okay? Statements against theology or theologians. First, that the most exalted of all vocations is that of the philosopher, okay? So that's, that's, the, first, that's the first statement. The most exalted, the most important of all vocations is that of the philosopher. Of course, during the medieval times, it's classic times, when, uh, when theology is the most important science and philosophy is considered just a, a handmaid of theology, to have this statement is, is really, can be considered as anti-theology. It is unimaginable that there would be a kind of statement like this. That the most important vocation is that of the philosopher. Second, that there's no subject he is not competent to discuss and settle. 
So it's like a slap on the face of the theologian. No? That the most important vocation is the philosopher and that he's competent in almost everything. So imagine if uh, you, you talk about that in the faculty, in the University of Paris, in the faculty of arts. So that's, that's, the, that's the attitude during those times about about uh, about philosophy and against theology. So sometimes we think uh, that theology was the queen is the queen science. That theology is the most important science during this scholastic era. That philosophy is just a handmaid of theology. But during those times, there were already certain rationalistic tendencies. Okay? And third. One gains nothing in the way of knowledge by knowing theology. <laughs> okay, so, and then the last one, only the philosophers deserve to be called wise. The speech of the theologian is founded on fables. Okay, so these are very, very antagonistic, I would say, statements against theology and theologians. Right? So, understandably, uh, Saint uh, Bonaventure was quite, you know, uh, was, was reacting against this brand of rationalism during those times. And therefore, he focused more on speculative theology. Okay, now as to what Saint Thomas would would Saint Thomas reply about on this on these uh, errors, uh, we'll see that when we when we discuss Saint Thomas. Okay. So Saint Bonaventure, who believed in the validity of Christian revelation, have noted the inability of philosophers. So this is now Saint Bonaventure reacting against philosophers. But of course, uh, he also uh, respected Aristotle in some in, in some sense, especially Plato. He actually prefers Plato than Aristotle, uh, understandably because Saint Augustine favored more Plato than Aristotle. So he noted the inability of philosophers in general and of Aristotle in particular. To learn the full truth about man's existential situation. Okay. So this is again a charge against Aristotle, but as we will see later, he also followed some of the ideas of Aristotle. So conversely, Saint Bonaventure tried to show the continuity between the aims of philosophy and those of theology. So while he was critical of the philosophers, he was also talking about the connection, the relationship between theology and philosophy. He maintained that philosophy has a genuine, albeit limited autonomy. And the knowledge it yields is a stage, like a stepping stone, you know, in the overall ascent of the mind to true wisdom. So he recognizes the importance of philosophy in the overall ascent of the mind to true wisdom. Of course, the culmination of this ascent of the mind is uh, found in the quasi-experiential knowledge of God that was achieved by such mystics as St. Francis of Assisi. Of course, uh, his example will always be St. Francis. Right? So this quasi-experiential knowledge of God. Of course, this, this mystical union or mystical experience, according to St. Bonaventure, cannot equal the actual union of, with God of the angels or of the soul when it reaches heaven. But in this life, we can achieve this quasi-experiential knowledge, this kind of mystical union, no? similar to the beatific vision 
of St. Thomas Aquinas. But for St. Bonaventure, that is just a foretaste of what, of, of the actual union with God or the actual contemplation when the soul reaches heaven. No? So according to St. Bonaventure, St. Francis of Assisi attained the mystics and Saint, like St. Francis attained this, you know, this, this wisdom, this uh, quasi experiential knowledge of God before they died or while they are still here. The perfect experience of that union with God will be in heaven as enjoyed by the angels and the saints in the company of God. So St. Bonaventure's philosophy is like that of his two predecessors in the Franciscan chair of theology, like uh, Hales okay, and uh, <clears throat> John of La Rochelle uh, is a combination of Augustinian with peripatetic elements, meaning Augustinian and Aristotelian elements. And so his philosophy is very much similar in the sense to the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. No? Only that St. Saint, Saint Thomas was also also studied Augustinian philosophy and uh, Aristotle's philosophy and Plato's philosophy and even the Arab philosophers and the Greek commentators of the philosophy of Aristotle. So, but of course, Saint Bonaventure was leaning more on the Augustinian traditions. Plus, of course, the elements of the philosophy of Aristotle. However, instead of drawing from the psychology of St. Augustine, St. Bonaventure, the Seraphic daughter, draw rather from the mysticism of the Christian Plato. Okay. By Christian Plato, we mean the, this uh, form of Neoplatonism that has been Christianized. At the same time, retaining in his account of the relation of form to matter, some of the anti-Aristotelian tenets which had even in his day became or become part of the traditional teaching of the Franciscans. So St. Bonaventure, you know, studied many different philosophies and ideas, but he was careful. You know, he was careful in, you know, in integrating some of these ideas pretty much like St. Thomas. So he always, like St. Thomas, he will always make some distinction. Okay? He will always make a distinction, a distinction, of course, between, for example, uh, philosophy and theology or between this, the thought of this philosopher and the other philosopher and so on and so forth. So, so um, he was careful uh, to distinguish between theology, which has four objects, the supernatural truth, and philosophy, which has for its object the truth of the natural order. So, like St. Thomas, he recognizes that uh, there is only one truth, but you always talk of the supernatural and the natural truth, and that they have their own respective orders and objects. He is inclined, however, to attach more importance than St. Thomas does to the emotional and volitional element in philosophy and to the affective and the ascetico, uh, ascetico um, mystic aspect of theology. So again, as we said, this is where we can draw some uh, differences between St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure. Uh, this this leaning towards the emotional volitional element in philosophy is somehow influenced by the volitional tendency of Saint Augustine because Saint Augustine, although we always say that Saint Augustine combines reason and will, but uh, many many commentators would say that he was more on the voluntarism side. Augustine was more on the voluntarism side than the rational side. St. Thomas, although he also combines faith and uh, will and reason, 
was more on the rational side rather than on the volitional side. No? So it, uh, the difference is where do you put more emphasis on reason or will? Okay. So uh, like for example, in St. Augustine, there is the notion of love is more pronounced in St. Augustine. No? Love, the notion of love. Of course, we also find that in St. Thomas, but if you compare that to St. Augustine and St. Bonaventure, this, this emotional and volitional element in their philosophy, in the affective, is more rather more pronounced. Still, it is possible to set aside for a moment the mystic and emotional elements of his system of thought so as to enumerate the points of teachings in which he differs from St. Thomas and to treat under separate titles his mysticism and his alleged ontologism. So the theology of the theology of Bonaventure uh, borders on the mystical, on the mystical. Okay. Uh, perhaps because of the of the Franciscan tradition, the, the mysticism imbued by Saint Francis. Uh, maybe it, uh, it is also based on the differences in the spirituality of the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Maybe I'm just speculating here. Okay, so let's go now to his philosophy. I mean, specifically his philosophy. And let's talk about his metaphysics. Now, and this is very, this is very interesting. And this is actually uh, one of the comments. This is the, this is a, uh, how do you put this? This is a common observation between, uh, uh, observation between, uh, uh, observation of the, the difference between St. Thomas' philosophy in the Franciscans. And this is the element of Christ. They, they, some observes that uh, Hales and the Franciscans are more Christocentric in their theology okay? because of the emphasis on Christ. Of course, we can say that, well, St. Thomas, of course, also talks about Christ you know, uh, in his in his writings, in his theology. But this is one observation that there is always an element of Christ in their philosophy. And you can see this in this in this uh, position of Saint Saint Bonaventure. He said Christ, the Son of God, not Aristotle, is the metaphysician par excellence. That's a that's a bold it's a very bold statement. As Christ said, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and then go to the Father. Came from the Father, then come into the world and then return to the Father. So, so anyone may say, Lord, I came forth from you the all high, I go to you, the all high, and means, and by means of you, the all high. According to uh, Bonaventure, this statement, or this, what Christ said, that I came forth from the Father, and then come into the world, and then relieve the world, and then go back to the Father, actually contains the whole of metaphysics. It contains emanation, it contains exemplarity, and it contains consummation or the return. Okay, so when, when you talk about in metaphysics, St. Augustine talk about where we came from, okay? The origin, for example, from the Neoplatonist from Plotinus talks about uh, there is the one, no creation, no, uh, then emanation, the one, the news, 
the soul and then matter and so on so it, it has the element of emanation i came from the father so i emanated from the father then exemplarity that i am the father so i am like the father i commune with the father then he came into the world and then he will go back so it contains this the emanation exemplarity and then consummation consummation here is the similar to the return of augustine to god so we came from god we are here and then we will go back to god so the model of this metaphysics is christ himself that's why buddha Pancho said christ is the metaphysician par excellence because he said i came forth from the father i have come into this world again i will leave the world and go back to the father so that's an entire metaphysics for saint augustine okay. so it is in this way that one becomes a true metaphysician okay. so the the ideal the exemplar the ideal metaphysician for saint bonaventure is not aristotle but christ himself now there are three elements of the metaphysics of saint bonaventure his notion of emanation then his notion of exemplarism and the third one is idea of consummation consummation is the enlightened return that's similar to the return of saint augustine okay so remember the the two elements of the philosophy of saint augustine so let's talk about emanation so we are we're going to discuss emanation here with the background of our discussion on augustine and neoplatonism where we discuss first the notion of emanation okay so again emanation uh, from the platonic from the platonic neoplatonic tradition and of course followed by augustine is that there's an overflowing of the goodness of god that god is the perfect cause okay the perfect cause of everything but and then of course that he creates you know, through an endless emanation so there's always a continuing creation okay the continuing preservation of what god created so saint bonaventure like saint augustine uses the term emanation to designate the general theory of how creation proceeds from god so we are already informed of the augustinian uh, definition of creation as creatio ex nihilo creation from nothing uh saint bonaventure also is to reconcile this emanation with christian theology okay pretty much what saint augustine did in his philosophy okay so saint augustine uh, followed the philosophy of the neoplatonist and then integrated christian theology based on the theology of saint paul okay so saint bonaventure here is just is trying to continue expand more on that on that notion the tradition by combining this neoplatonic and augustinian notion of emanation with christian theology so in the uh, breviloquium he writes the whole of the cosmic machine was produced in time <clears throat> and from nothing from nothing ex nihilo by one principle only who is supreme and whose power though immense still arranges all according to a certain weight number and measure so we're talking of there's only one principle here and that ultimate principle is god okay who has the supreme power but when he created by emanation he arranged this according to degrees of perfection varying degrees of perfection so from the highest to the lowest 
And like some of his contemporary Christian thinkers, Saint Bonaventure rejects the concept of the eternity of the world. Of course, this concept of the eternity of the world came from Aristotle. And it was also picked up by Saint Thomas, but Saint Thomas said, well, as far as philosophy is concerned, well, it can be eternal because the philosopher said so, but in theology, as the scripture said, God created the world in time and therefore it cannot be eternal. So Saint Bonaventure follows the same conception. He rejects that idea, the idea of the world as eternal. Of the eternity of matter, of course, that if the world is physical, matter is physical, matter cannot be eternal. So there's no eternity of matter. And then the dual principle of good and evil. Uh, this is something that uh, Saint Augustine addressed. Okay, uh, this is coming from the mannequins, you know, the the the, the dual principle of good and evil. So Saint Augustine, Saint Bonaventure, Alexander of Hales, and Saint Thomas, they all rejected this idea of the dual principle of good and evil and the existence of intermediary causes. His description of the supreme principle implies that a perfect power must be free to create varying degrees of perfection. So that supreme principle is no other than God. So that supreme perfect power is free to create whatever he created in varying degrees of perfection. So again, this talks about the degrees of perfection. And when you talk of degrees of perfection, therefore, automatically you posit the existence or the presence of evil in the created order. Because God created this, therefore, there will be a privation of goodness. And this privation of goodness will account for the degrees, varying degrees of perfection of created beings. Okay, so there's only one perfect power, perfect being, God himself. And he was free to create anything and whatever he created will have varying degrees of perfection. Of course, man belongs to the highest, you know, to the higher rank of below the angels. So that's the notion of emanation. Now, let's go to his idea of exemplarism, which is... I rather, uh, well, it still follows the idea of St. Augustine, but it's already injected here many Aristotelian and even uh, Platonic elements. Emanation is the concern of both moral philosophy and metaphysics. God, as the final cause and ultimate goal of man's quest for happiness, is the object of both metaphysics and philosophy, meaning God is both the object of the investigation of the moral philosopher, because it is the uh, the goal of man to attain happiness, and it is also the object of investigation of the metaphysician, because God is also the final cause. So God as the final cause is the object of metaphysics. God as the ultimate goal of man in his quest for happiness is the object of moral philosophy. However, according to Saint Bonaventure, only the metaphysician can understand God as an exemplar cause. Okay? As the exemplary cause of all the things that he created. So <clears throat> And it is in analyzing this aspect of the science of causes and first principles that man is most truly a metaphysician. So it's in the area, it's in the realm of metaphysics to study God as the ultimate cause and the ultimate principle of everything. Okay. So that's the uh, object of metaphysics. You see there, the common and proper object 
of metaphysics, God. So, common object, God, proper object, God as the ultimate cause and the ultimate principle. Now, for a Bonaventure, for Saint Bonaventure, this metaphysical pursuit, you know, this pursuit of analyzing the ultimate cause of everything, begins with reason. It begins with reason. So metaphysics begins with reason. But it can only be successful if it is done by a man of faith. So this is now where there's always that combination of philosophy and theology. So metaphysics begins with reason, but it can only be successfully terminated by a man of I don't know if that is another way of saying that believe uh, in order to understand or understand in order to believe. But this is how Bonaventure puts it. Metaphysics starts with reason and it can only reach its end point, successfully reach its end point if it is done by a man with faith. And so it's a combination of reason and faith. Now, in doing this, to, to, to explain this, Saint Bonaventure compared the two greatest pagan philosophers, Aristotle and Plato. He maintained that both erred in their position. Obviously, because, well, they, they started, they used reason, but obviously, they are not men of faith, or they are not men with faith. That's why they cannot be, they cannot end their metaphysics on a successful note. Okay? So, he said, Plato, the master of wisdom, erred in looking only upward to the realm of the eternal values, or the realm of the immutable ideas. Remember that Two world theory of Plato, and Plato recognizes the the ideal world. Well, he is, he also recognized the physical world, the world of appearances. But for him, they are not as important as the world of form. So, for August, for for but Saint Bonaventure, Plato only look up to the realm of the eternal values, and he ignored those at the the lower ground what about aristotle aristotle he said the master of the natural sciences look only earthward to the everyday sensible world that plato neglected so for him plato and aristotle neglected something plato neglected the world the sensible world, the world of experience, and just considered the world of forms. Aristotle, on the other hand, just focused on the earthly, everyday, sensible world and neglected or ignored the ideal world of Plato. So both have something lacking in their system, in their metaphysics or philosophy. But according to St. Bonaventure, Aristotle has a greater error because in rejecting Plato's ideas as a whole, he closed the door to a full understanding of the universe in terms of its causes. Because for Bonaventure, of course, the ultimate cause of the universe is there in the realm pointed to by Plato not in the everyday world emphasized by Aristotle. So for St. Bonaventure, while the two have their own respective errors, the error of Aristotle is greater than the error of Plato. So for St. Augustine, uh, for St. Bonaventure, St. Augustine is the model of Christian wisdom. 
he's the model metaphysician uh, of course christ but he's all he's he is the model of a philosopher of a thinker because he combined the science of aristotle with that of the wisdom of plato okay so saint augustine is the embodiment of a philosopher or metaphysician who started with reason and terminated this metaphysical pursuit through faith right so as a christian saint augustine completed what plato could only begin and he demonstrated that plato's archetypal ideas or the exemplary causes or models that God, that God used in creating the universe out of nothing, a thought that a philosopher alone could establish. Okay. So, as a philosopher, he recognized the contribution, Augustine, recognized the contribution of Plato. Okay. He also showed by St. Augustine, that these ideas, these exemplar ideas, are associated in a special way with the second person of the Trinity, Christ himself. Christ. An insight that can only be discovered through divine revelation. So this is how, where or how St. Bonaventure fused philosophy and revelation. And he used Saint Augustine as a model was able to complete the connection between philosophy and theology. So as a philosopher, he recognized that Plato is right, that these exemplary ideas or models in creating in the universe are already in the mind of God. Okay, so that's Plato. And of course, that's that was further explained by Plotinus and then followed by St. Augustine. However, according to, to Bonaventure, that project cannot be completed if we don't have the inspiration from divine revelation. Because it is through divine revelation that we discover that these ideas are associated with the second person of the Trinity, with Christ. Okay. So, but the venture following Saint Augustine explained that since the Father begets the Son, of course, that's part of our of our creed, right? Begets the Son by an eternal act of self knowledge. The Son may also be called the wisdom of the Father. And expresses in his person all of God's creative possibilities, including the exemplary ideas. Therefore, Christ as the word or logos, which was only outlined in the writings of the philosophers, because the philosophers already recognized the logos. But according to Bonaventure, well, they recognize the Logos, but they never recognize that this Christ or this Logos is Christ himself. But Christ as a Logos was fully revealed at the beginning of the gospel, especially in the gospel of John, as the one through whom all things are made, meaning he becomes the exemplary cause and who enlightens every man who comes into the world. It's a bit. It's a beautiful integration of the of of metaphysics in the philosophical sense and metaphysics in the theological sense. And that's how Saint Bonaventure somehow fused these two, you know, ideas using Augustine as the model.
Does Saint Bonaventure maintain that Christ is the model of God for humanity? The word is not only God, but also a perfect man. He gives us the power of becoming the sons of God, and he is the one master of all sciences. So according to Saint Bonaventure, the theory of ideas of Plato was first was the first philosophical approximation of this theological insight. And Aristotle's rejection of this view led to Aristotle's errors about God. That's why he favors in this sense, in this regard, Plato as against Aristotle. Now, by integrating Christian theology and exemplarism to the whole of creation, for St. Bonaventure, creation takes a sacramental character. It becomes a material means of bringing the soul to God and because of this explanation then uh, that provides him with a way of explaining how we can go back to God or how we can understand God. Nature for, a, for Saint Bonaventure becomes the mirror of God reflecting God's perfection in varying degrees. Again, the degrees of perfection. So, for example, in inorganic substances, we see only a shadowy likeness, the umbra. He said the umbra of God. A shadow of the essence of God. And through the lower forms of life, so this is already the uh, organic substances, only that they are lower forms compared to man. Okay, we can see the trace, okay, the trace, the visages of the creator. So like shadowy likeness, traces, and then in the soul of man, we see God's full image, the uh, image, the ima image of God. And in the angels, we see God's similitude. Similitude. Okay, so, yeah, so these are the varying, this is how St. Bonaventure puts the varying degrees of perfection okay, from the immaterial, from the material substances, the inorganic substances, to the organic yet lower forms of life, to man and the angels. So, the recognition of God in nature begins in philosophy, but it is continued and perfected in theology. And St. Bonaventure argued that philosophers know that secondary beings seem imply a first. So if there is a secondary being, as the philosophers recognize, there must be the first. Dependent beings imply independent being. Contingent being implies a more necessary being. And the relative implies the absolute. The imperfect implies the perfect. So for Saint Bonaventure, Plato's participated being implies one unparticipated being. And if there are potential beings, then there must be pure beings or pure act that must exist. Composite things imply the existence of something simple. The changeable can only coexist with the unchangeable. But although a philosopher can discover a spiritual God as the ultimate object of the soul's search for truth and happiness, 
only a man of faith like saint augustine can find the trinity manifest through creation so again this is a fusion of philosophy and theology Okay, I will stop here and maybe you have some questions before I continue. If you have some questions. Okay. Uh, so for, this is from Jess. Sending emanation is the act of creation that outside of time or outside of time is the act of creation done in a single event having continuous effect or is it done every single time in reality? Well, this is already answered by, by Augustine huh? that when God created, uh, he, he, uh, that that creation happened in happened at the same time so when god created time started okay time started because part of god's creation of the temporal or, or the of the physical order is a temporal order and it is it is one act of creation but at the same time it is continued no see uh the explanation of this preservation of Augustine is followed by Saint uh, by Saint Bonaventure, because Saint Bonaventure also subscribed to the idea of the similar reason of Saint Augustine. Okay, you uh, other questions. No more? Uh, yes, Father Serene. Sir, uh, St. Augustine in his writings would say that uh, uh, theology would be, uh, or rather faith would be an inferior form of knowledge. Would Bonaventure go along the same line? Based on my readings, no. I think uh, it's it's theology that perfects. It's theology that perfects knowledge. Mm, so that means there has been a revision already from Augustine. Yeah, uh, that's 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 my take. No. Yes. yes. Uh, reading, reading reading Bonaventure, I think. Uh, Although he used Augustine mm. as uh, you know as a model, but I think he takes theology on a higher on a higher level. Although uh, I have some reservations, well, because we can say that uh, it's a less perfect knowledge for Augustine because, and I and I think uh, we have to qualify that in the sense that. We don't have a full vision of the object of theology. As compared to philosophy, who has a full vision of its object. However, if you're going to compare, and I think uh, these philosophers, Augustine and the rest of the Christian philosophers say that the object of theology compared to the object of philosophy, it's a much higher object. Because the object of philosophy, the truth as the object of philosophy, is the truth in the natural order. But the truth as the object of theology is a truth in the higher order. So in that sense, we can say that philosophy or theology is higher than philosophy because its object is higher than philosophy. But in terms of the vision of that object, Philosophy would be higher because it has a much clearer view 
of its object as compared to theology, which does not enjoy that clear vision of the object. And my reply, my, my position to that is based on the distinction of St. Thomas between uh, faith and knowledge. Because for St. Thomas, faith and knowledge may be both assent, intellectual assent, but the object of reason, the object of, philo of knowledge rather, can be clearly seen, can be demonstrated clearly. But the object of faith is something that is, you know, you will need grace. You will need, that's exactly faith, in order for you to understand this. So it lacks the vision. Uh, it lacks a, a vision uh, if you're going to compare that to philosophy. Thank you, sir. Very good answer. Thank you for the, thank you for the question, Father. Thank you, sir. Yes, Father uh, Roxanne. Doctor, uh, yes. when I uh, think about uh, about these both discipline, philosophy and theology, I think the uh, Augustine and Bonaventure they express what they think in the words. So, what is really in their mind, we don't know uh, because we understand through their words and. For me, uh, I think the discipline as such both are equal because we learn from we learn some knowledge from those dis disciplines. Yeah. As you said, the content of uh, subject, since it's, it's a, about higher order in uh, theology, uh, natural order in philosophy, we say that uh, this is higher than because God God is higher than the natural nature. But as such knowledge, I think both are in the same level. We learn something, but the content is higher. I feel yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, yes, they both provide us with a certain knowledge, but the content of that knowledge are different. And yeah. we can say that the content of the knowledge of theology is higher than the content of the knowledge that philosophy provides us. Yes, yeah. Father Sir, so just just out of curiosity, uh, or, or rather, digging into your your experience, sir, uh, has there been any other philosopher uh, in later stages that has taken a very bold stand like Bonaventure to put? Jesus Christ as the metaphysician par excellence, up there, right up there, you know. Has there been anybody? Uh, I know it's quite difficult in modern and contemporary, but maybe. By, I'm not. By experience. I'm not. I, I don't know, <laughs> Father, because actually this is the first time. Yes. In my release of, of Buddha Avenger, this is the first time that somebody said, I have not encountered that in St. Thomas either. Uh, what, a bold statement. what a bold statement to say that Christ is the metaphysician for excellence <laughs> and not Aristotle. No? So act actually there's something in the personality of, of, of Bonaventure because he has this knack for, you know, uh, playing with words. Mm. He, 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 sometimes, and that's why, that's why sometimes some of his commentators will say that he does not take, sometimes he does not take theology seriously in the sense that, you know, he can play with words. Uh, but in his writings, he's very serious. But in his, you know, when he tries to explain uh, extemporaneously, for example, what he is, what is in his mind, he could appear to be, you know, he could appear to, uh, he's a master of, of, of terms, of, of words. We can play with words of course uh there is a deeper thought in the words but uh probably that that could play into this no uh, uh I, I have never really encountered a philosopher who would say <laughs> even the christians who would say that christ is the metaphysician for excellence i don't know there may be some other uh I, I think uh further i think like to respond to that i mean uh 
I remembered my uh, classes with Father Auriada before he got sick. Uh -huh. uh, he said that uh, it is a uh, very impossible to for philosophers to posit Christ as the object of philosophy because Christ is not a philosophical term. Uh -huh. That is why it is not a, it is somehow not compatible with the philosophical. Although it may begin there, but it is never a proper object of philosophy to posit Christ. It belongs to theology. So it, it was difficult for philosophy. But I think that what what Augustine said is not Christ as the object of philosophy. It is Christ philosophizing or meta metaphysizing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so even is, even. Uh, Okay, consider that, that one. I think uh, Christ philosophizing it will be very hard because he has not has no written works. I mean, unlike other philosophers, it would be siguro si if uh, in his understanding of philosophizing Christ as philosophizing, it would be on the the sources would for that would be not on his personal, ano, but for him, but, but by his apostles siguro. Uh -huh. I think that is. Somehow, no. Because he he didn't write anything, unlike other philosophers. Well, he does not have to write anything to be a philosopher. If he is everything, he could be everything, and he he could be the best philosopher. I mean, I'll give you an example, and I use this in my logic class. You no, know? when I teach uh, dilemma, dilemmatic arguments. Okay, dilemmatic arguments. I always use Christ as an example of a good logician. And I use this example of this account when Christ, the actually I have two examples here. When Christ was confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes, whether it is lawful to pay taxes to the Romans or not. So they came to Christ with a question asking Christ if it is lawful to the pay to pay taxes to the Romans or not and obviously that question poses a dilemma for Christ because if he say that it is lawful to pay taxes to the Romans then his opponents the scribes in the palace will say oh look at this man he's siding with our enemies and we know that the uh, the the Pharisees or the Jews hated the Romans. So if Christ will say it's lawful to pay taxes to the Romans, then he is just is justifying uh, the Roman rule. But if Christ will say it is not lawful to pay taxes to the Romans, then they will charge Christ of you know being a rebel against the Romans. So whether Christ say lawful or not lawful, they will always have some charges against Christ. So that question poses a perfect dilemma, a perfect dilemma against Christ. And how did Christ escape that dilemma? The dilemmatic argument. Well, he asked for a coin, which they used to pay taxes. And then he just asked, and whose image is this? The image of the coin that you pay for your taxes you used to pay for your taxes and they said it's caesar's and christ simply answered well then give back to caesar what is caesar's and give to god what is god's so as presented with a perfect dilemma but christ the logician was able to escape that dilemma what's a perfect logician there and there's another example when he was presented with this woman caught committing adultery so they asked jesus again according to the law of moses anyone caught committing adultery must be stoned to death so what shall we do with the woman obviously the question poses a dilemma christ will say well follow the law of moses stone her and then they will charge christ of not following his own law about you know loving your neighbor 
And if Christ will say, do not stone her, then he will also, they will also charge Jesus of not following the law of Moses. So whatever Christ will say, they will always charge Jesus of something against him. And what did Christ say? Okay. Let the, let the man without a sin be the first to cast a stone against her. So Christ was able again to escape that trap, that dilemmatic trap of his opponent. That's a good logician. Understanding fully well the nature of the argument and responding, you know, escaping all these logical traps. So, of course, in, on the technical aspect, we cannot, we, of course, we can say that, well, Christ cannot be the philosopher because the philosopher must be this and must be that. Okay? Must be able, must reason out, etc. But, you see, in the gospel, Jesus has demonstrated not only is love for people who are not Christians, they probably appreciate the wit of Christ in answering those questions of the Pharisees and of the scribes. He's witty, no? Of course, we, we, the answer of Christ is, is a lesson for us Christians, but for the non-believer, he's a good lawyer, actually. <laughs> I, would, I would say, I mean, he has a you know a way of of responding to philosoph even philosophical questions. I think it's a book about philosophy of Jesus. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, so th those are my those are my replies. Peter Kreft. Wow. Happy oh, okay. natin ano? Julian, baka ka. Thank you, sir. Uh, good thank discussion. you, thank you. All right. All right, so we continue our discussion. Now we are on the third aspect of St. Bonaventure's metaphysics. And this is uh, consummation or the enlightened return. Uh, in this third aspect of his metaphysics, he talked about the creature's fulfillment of its destiny by returning to God. And again, this is similar to the principle of return of Saint Augustine. So this is the third component. So there's the emanation, exemplar, exemplarism, and then the enlightened return or consummation. This return, which is also called by Saint Bonaventure as reductio, uh, in the case of the lower creation, meaning from man, you know, uh, lower creation, man, going back to God, is achieved in and through man, who praises God for and through subhuman creation. Man's return is made possible in turn by Christ. For man returns to God by living a moral or an upright life. That is by being uh, rightly aligned with the will of God or with God himself. And of course, this can only be achieved through the grace of Christ. So again, he adds here the element of Christ in our, in our return to to God. Uh, of course, St. Augustine also uh, stressed this, but it is not really as pronounced as the way St. Bonaventure puts it, you know? uh, always emphasizing the role of Christ uh, in, in this kind of metaphysics. So for St. Bonaventure, there is a triple uprightness, uprightness of the mind, of the will, and of our power, you know, the use of our power. Man's mind is right, or is rectus, when it has found truth, especially the eternal truth. His will is right, or upright, when it loves what is really good. And his exercise of power is right, when it is a continuation of God's ruling power. However, because of our original sin, or because of the fall, Man, or we, lost this triple righteousness. How uh, his intellect is lured by vain curiosity. It has uh, enmeshed itself in interminable, interminable doubts and futile controversies. His will is ruled by greed and concupiscence. 
And his exercise of power seeks autonomy, meaning being, you know, uh, independent of God. However, although man lost this original state or state of justice or this original state of uprightness, man still hungers for it. And this is uh, evidenced by his longing for the infinite good, which is revealed in his quest for pleasure. So there's always that quest, this longing for pleasure on man. And according to Bodhavendra, this longing for pleasure is actually indicative of his longing for the infinite good. So he longs to return to this good, to this infinite good. And through faith in God and God's love or grace, man can find his way back to God. So that's the return. Now, why enlightened? According to St. Bonaventure, reduction is also a quest for wisdom. And therefore, is an, in an extended theological sense, it is also metaphysical. It is enlightened because the return, this return, every branch of learning is a gift from above. As you will see later when we discuss the knowledge, the types of knowledge according to St. Bonaventure is coming from the light of God. And although man's return begins with the natural light of reason, as we've said, but the fish starts with reason, reflecting first on the external world and then returning inward in an analysis of the soul, it is perfected initially by a natural elimination of the divine ideas and then by varying additional degrees of supernatural illumination which culminate in the experiential cognition of God through mystical union. So the ultimate, the ultimate end really is to return to God, mystical union with God. But while we are here, we acquire this enlightenment. No, we acquire this uh, this uh, experience of being united with God. This mystical union here, no, I mean, knowing God in this life is not the same as the clear vision of the blessed in heaven. He compares it to the learned ignorance, which is referred to by the mystical writers. Like when they talk about the union of the soul with God in darkness, which is granted to saints like St. Francis before his death. So the mystics, they have encountered this, uh, reminds me of St. John on the cross talking about the darkness of the soul. Even St. Teresa of Calcutta talked about this this darkness of the soul but this darkness is this ignorance is actually a union with god but this union with god this mystical union with god in this life cannot be compared to that clear vision of blessedness enjoyed by saints and angels in heaven okay? and you, we can also talk of the beatific vision of saint thomas here no? about this mystical union all right, now let's go to his theory of knowledge. So we finish with metaphysics. Let's go to his theory of knowledge. I hope we have enough time. Saint Bonaventure believed that the mind has no innate ideas. No innate ideas. Alexander of Hales postulated in his Summa Theologica, Theologia or Theologica that ideas are latent in the aged intellect but are actually acquired only when the light of the agent intellect illumines the possible intellect. So he's talking here of the two kinds of the two aspects of the intellect that of course Aristotle talked about, no? Active and agent intellect. Now, St. Bonaventure rejected this and affirmed the idea of Aristotle that the mind at birth is a tabula rasa, it's a blank slate. Yes, said that it needs sensory perception before it can acquire any notions about the external world of objects. However, St. Bonaventure used the Augustinian theory of illumination 
to explain how the mind passes judgment on sensible things in terms of their values. So for example, when the mind judges something to be good or beautiful, there must be an implicit awareness on the part of the soul or on the part of the mind you know, of what beauty and goodness are in themselves. And this requires that the human mind must have some knowledge of the divine ideas through divine illumination. So here he combines Arist uh, 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 Augustine and Aristotle. And he differs from the position of his teacher, Alexander of Hales. Saint Bonaventure also claimed that in some mysterious ways, when we know a created object, our mind is simultaneously enlightened so that it is moved to judge correctly about the object and is therefore in accord with God's own mind on that subject matter. Okay. Now, although Saint Bonaventure agreed with Aristotle that our knowledge of the external world is sense dependent, he did not fully subscribe to the idea that nothing really is in the intellect that was not first in the senses. He held that the intellect can turn inward, as in this, in these mysterious ways, reflecting on the soul and its tendencies. And in analyzing the precise nature of the object of these tendencies, the mind discovers God and itself as his own image. So Saint Bonaventure teaches that we rise from a knowledge of creatures to a knowledge of God. But along the way, he employs many different ideas from Aristotle, from Bonaventure, and from Saint uh, Augustine. Okay? So that explains his notion of knowledge. Later on, uh, we will add to this when I talk about uh, his uh, mysticism. No? Because his theory of knowledge, especially this notion of divine illumination, really has a mystical character. Okay. Now, his cosmology. In his analysis of material creation of, of the physical world, St. Augustine combined several ideas from Aristotle and from other philosophers. First, he subscribed to Aristotle's theory of matter and form. But he also adopted the Arab philosopher as Avicebron's theory of hylomorphic composition of spiritual and corporeal creatures. Okay, uh, This is something that is uh, different, no? uh, different from the original theory of Aristotle about matter and form. No? Because for Aristotle, matter is pure potency and form is actuality. No? But Avicebro talks about the composition of spiritual and corporeal creatures. He argued that since creatures have some measure of potentiality, because only God is pure actuality, all creatures, and that would include the, the spiritual creatures like angels in the human soul, they must have some kind of matter. Okay? This follows, of course, from Aristotle's idea that matter is the principle and source of potentiality. So if creatures, regardless if they are physical or spiritual, will always have some measure of potentiality. And following Aristotle, the principle of potentiality is matter. And therefore, the spiritual creatures will always have some degree of materiality or corporeality. Okay? So, what results is what uh, 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 Bonaventure consists to be a spiritual matter. Of course, in Aquinas, that's that's quite impossible. No? How can a how can matter be spiritual? But this is a different interpretation. So there is a spiritual matter, which is found both in the angel and in the human soul, which is never separable 
from its spiritual form. So uh, fr from Aristotle and Aquinas, we always talk about the form being spiritual and the matter being physical or corporeal. But here, following Abisebron, Bonaventure, Saint Bonaventure talks about a spiritual matter and spiritual form. Therefore, such spiritual substances are not subject to change because they are spiritual. Okay? They cannot die or disintegrate like terrestrial bodies, nor can they be perfected by a hierarchy of forms as can corporeal matters. So, this is actually the basis of Saint Bonaventure for saying that angels, like the seraphims, that's why he is called now, now I can explain why he is called the seraphic doctor. Seraphims are angels with faces, and faces are actually based on materiality. So all finite being is composed of act and potency, and Saint Bonaventure follows this idea. And identifying, he identifies form with act and matter with potency. And teaches the doctrine advocated by Alexander of Hales that there is no form without matter. So again, not just Abisebron, but also Alexander of Hales talking about no form without matter. It's one of a distinctively Franciscan doctrines. No, this is a distinct you don't find that in Aquinas or even in 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 uh, in Saint Albert the Great about this uh, form with matter. The plurality of forms is another. So, besides the substantial form, which completes the being of a substance, there are subordinate forms, which are principles of ulterior perfection. With regard to the principle of individuation, that by which the individuals of the same species are differentiated from one another. Okay, so normally we only talk about there, there is a there is only one form. What individuate us is matter. Okay. So for Saint Bonaventure, says that the individuals is individualized both by matter and by their form which is different from St. Thomas. Because for St. Thomas, matter is the principle of individuation. It's the form that provides the universal essence. And it's matter that distinguishes us from other objects, individualized us. Okay? M but matter, and matter because matter is not present, in angels, then the angels cannot be individualized in the way that physical beings are individualized. But Saint Bon for Saint Bonaventure, this principle of individuality is found both in matter and in form. Now, last, under his cosmology, his adaptation of Saint Augustine's theory of seminal reasons or rationis seminalis. So, he adopted Augustine's theory of seminal reasons. However, he interpreted it within the framework of a general Aristotelian formula that forms are educed from the potency of matter. Unlike St. Thomas, who accounts for the production of created substances by postulating the potency of the matter acted upon by acted upon, and the causality or efficiency of the agent which it acts, Saint Bonaventure interprets these potencies as active powers rather than passive potentialities. So when you say potencies normally, well, they are passive, they should be acted upon. But according to Bonaventure, Saint Bonaventure, these potencies are active powers. So meaning the seminal reasons are active powers they are not passive so they are not latent forms existing in matter in a germinal state there are forms that exist in matter in a germinal state so the 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 seeds are there and it has the 
power. It has the capacity. It can actualize itself. And this actually explains the continuous creation. No? So, according to Bonaventure, there are external agents that cooperate with these latent powers, just like, for example, uh, a gardener who cultivates the seed bed so that the seeds germinate and bear fruits or bear flower and flowers. So that's how Bonaventure explains this seminal reason. So uh, these are the, uh, he explained this in terms again of the uh, dynamics of the matter and form of akin potency of Aristotle. So we can see here how Bonaventure integrates, ties up, you know, certain aspects of the philosophy of Augustine, philosophy of, of Aristotle and the other philosophers. See here, uh, quite similar to what St. Thomas did in his philosophy. Okay, now for our last topic, mysticism. Okay. The mystical elements of St. Benaventure's system of thought are developed in his uh, the itinerary of the mind to God and his uh, reduction of the arts to theology. And here he discussed knowledge as originating from God. So here he discussed about the, the theory of divine illumination. Buddha Benjamin maintains that all the knowledge, all our knowledge rather, are originated from a single source. A single light, God Himself. Okay? So the nearer we are to the source, the brighter the light. Okay, and we can only gain access to the source of light by grace. Okay, so God is the source of this light, and in turn, they are ordered to the knowledge of the sacred scriptures. Saint Bonaventure enumerates four of these lights, okay, in increasing importance. So first, there is in the uh, the knowledge of the medical arts or mecha mechanical arts, which illuminates the form produced by man. Sensitive knowledge, the natural forms. The third is philosophical knowledge, the object of which is the intelligible truths, and the second is scriptures, the object of which is the salvific truth. So correspondingly to this knowledge are four illuminations, exterior light or the light of the mechanical art, an inferior light or light of the senses, an interior light or the light of philosophical knowledge and a superior light or the light of grace and of the sacred scriptures. The first light illumines with respect to the forms of artifacts. The second with respect to the natural forms. The third with respect to intellectual truths. And of course, the fourth and the highest with respect to saving truth, the salvific truth. Now, the first light which sheds, sheds its lights on the forms of artifacts or things which are, as it were, external to the human person and intended to supply the needs of the body. And this is called the light of the mechanical art. Okay, so everything pertaining to physical, to the senses, okay, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the physical, to the bodily, that's, that's belonging to the, first, to the first light, the first illumination. The second light, which uh, provides light for the apprehension of the natural forms, is the light of sense knowledge. And this is called inferior light because sense perception begins with an inferior object and takes place by the aid of the 
corporal life meaning of the of, of the of the of the physical life no uh, like for example uh, if you want to see if i want to see what i am reading here in front of me i will need the corporal light of the of this light in uh, above me no so i will need that so the senses will need this corporal light and of course this light will have five divisions corresponding to our five senses so obviously the uh, the second light here uh, is not just light in terms of our sight sense of sight but in terms of our five internal senses okay so that's the second illumination now we understand the natural forms uh, the light of sense knowledge the third light which enlightens the human person in the investigation of the intelligible truth is the light of philosophical knowledge. Now, it is called interior because it inquires into the inner and hidden causes through the principles of learning and natural truth, which, according to St. Bonaventure, is connatural to the human mind. And there are three uh, threefold divisions of this light. I will just enumerate them. I will no longer discuss them one by one. No, but you have the natural, no, natural, uh, rational philosophy, natural philosophy, and moral philosophy. Okay, so that's the third illumination. Okay. Now the fourth light, which provides the illumination with respect to the salvific truth is the light of sacred scripture. Okay. This light is called superior because it leads to the higher, of course, to the higher things by revealing truths which transcend, of course, reason. No, it transcends our senses and it transcends our reason. And also because it is not acquired by human research, but it comes down from the source, from God himself, the God of lights, by divine inspiration. So you can imagine the, the scriptural writers receiving this fourth light when they wrote the scriptures. And probably imagine Saint Luke, Saint Mark, Saint Matthew, Saint John when they wrote the Gospels, enjoying this divine light, this third light. So while in its literal sense it is one, still in its spiritual and mystical sense it is also threefold, because in all the books of the Scriptures beyond the literal meaning which the word express outwardly there are threefold spiritual meaning and those of us who are uh, familiar with the, with the scriptures you know, those who study the scriptures uh, know this threefold spiritual meaning i remember father marcus mentioning this in his uh, talk a uh, few nights ago the allegorical by which we are taught that to believe concerning divinity and humanity, humanity, then the moral meaning by which we are taught how to live, and then the anagogical by which we are taught how to cling to God. So, of course, there is always the literal meaning, but because of this divine, you know, divine light, we can have this threefold meaning, the allegorical, the moral, and the anagogical meanings. So that is how uh, the theory of knowledge of Augustine is infused with mysticism. Okay, and I will end there. And I will just share these uh, notes with you, uh, but I just use this as a guide of my of my lecture. Hopefully, uh, 
we have taken down notes because some, some of my explanations are not found in the in the lectures but uh it's recorded and hopefully i can i can i can edit the the recordings and share the recordings of my lectures with you so i will stop there if you have some questions then uh we still have time for to answer some of your questions okay oh maraming nag wait uh yes uh hendrik uh, talk about the spiritual matter was yeah. he suggesting that somehow the, the spiritual beings are not pure spirits or is this a special matter which is uh which is difficult to describe or to this to define for him all right uh the, so there is there is a spiritual substance okay there is a spiritual substance but the spiritual substance is not really pure spiritual substance because there is only one pure spiritual substance as far as Agosti, uh Bonaventure is concerned and that is God okay because for him when you say pure actuality that would be pure spiritual being so all the rest all the create all the all creations all things that God created will have matter and form will have actuality and potentiality and following aristotle potentiality resides in matter so there is matter even in spiritual substances now it will be something that is special in the sense that it is a matter that will well it's it, it's not the same as our matter but just the same it is a prince it's still matter but because we talk like for example in, the, in saint thomas we talk about secondary matter there will be no secondary matter in the spiritual substances that will be pure matter okay so it's different from you know uh if this is the first time you heard about this spiritual matter and you've been listening to aquinas and this is something difficult to digest you know if, especially if you are already convinced about saint thomas's principle of individuation based on materiality and then all of a sudden oh <laughs> yeah, there is something something different you know? so that, that, that's the you know i hope i answered your question Henry. you know sometimes it's 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 also it's good to know about these particularities of different philosophers you know? uh, because had it been that uh bonaventure became you know uh, there was a continued interest in his philosophy not just in aquinas uh, <laughs> That could be our belief now. I mean, that could be the philosophy that we will accept or that we will be, not accept, but we will be accustomed to. Huh? So we've been used to he hearing St. Thomas. And uh, when we hear something different from St. Thomas, parang, and here he digest. It's difficult to digest because, you know, for a long time we've been convinced that saint thomas is right no? well we can still be convinced that saint thomas is right but we need to also appreciate or understand other opinions and for me that's the beauty of philosophy <laughs> that keeps philosophy going no? <laughs> there is no university of text there's no university of text. It's always equivocal. No? So it's always subject to interpretation. All right. You have other questions? Oh. Uh, uh, Jess. Uh, yeah. Hello, po, Doc. i uh, like to uh, also ask about regarding spiritual matter, Doc. Um, yeah. How is, uh, uh, of course, uh, it was uh, written, I mean, 
uh, in the readings that no somehow Putin uh, Putin say somehow refers to active powers. Yeah. No, am I right? Rather than passive potentialities. So how are this? You know, uh, supposedly as uh, and as we uh, uh, as uh, the conventional understanding of matter and potentiality is somehow not an active entity as opposed to uh, actuality and pure form. Yeah. I would like to ask, how did you know what? Uh, what pushes? Uh, what is uh, the motive behind Bonaventure's conception of these things? Surely it is now somehow a random chance. I mean, there is somehow motive uh, motive behind it. Was it because he is quite? Uh, there is an urgent need to, let's say, uh, distinguish angels from God in terms of pure substances, or is there something more? You know, but. Okay, uh, there are, there are, I think, two elements in the in the question. The way I understand it, first, uh, regarding the distinction between uh, act and potency and matter and form. You know, uh, if you go by Aristotle, Aristotle will tell us that there is uh, act and potency, and that form is the one that possesses the actuality and matter is potentiality so it's matter that receives actuality from the form so matter cannot have actuality it can only have potentiality it cannot be it cannot actualize itself except by the fact that it is actualized because it exists but it does not have the actuality that the form possesses so even for example in man we always say that uh, the body is matter and it is actualized by the form which is the soul okay now well, bonaventure tells us that the the, the 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 matter is not this especially with the with a uh, similar reason they are not passive uh, potentialities that they, they do not just wait they do not just wait to be actualized okay now I think what is what is important I think for Bonaventure even for St. Augustine is to explain how how to explain the continuous preservation or creation of God okay so it's it, it's it's rather uh, it is informed or it is motivated by the need to explain how can we explain this continuous this continuous creation when some for example when a seed grows there's a new tree there's a new plant how do you explain that? So I think they start from there. It's not about, okay, these are the principles. So let's apply these principles down to the to the physical material things. No, there are emerging realities in the physical world, in the material world that needs to be explained. And therefore they go back to the original principle and see how we can use these principles and explain this emerging, this this you know this uh, this continuous uh, generation of things. So I think that's that's the that's the motivation for that. It's not starting with the principle and then uh, let's see how this principle will apply. No, it's like there is a there is a concrete reality here that there is a continuous you know creation and God cannot. Con cannot always create every time yeah, like for example uh, every time a, a fetus is conceived then Christ then God will create again and again and again so but it, it, that's not the most logical way to explain it there should be something in it that continues it to you know to generate itself so that's the motivation for for this principle but but of course, that's, but of course that 
that's my that's my uh, that's my interpretation of of this uh, of this thought of Augustine and Bonaventure. So it means that ano, um, uh, potentiality is active in a sense that yes. has the you know. Yes, as 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 far as this this uh, as far as in so far as we try to explain the continuous creation of of things. Okay, thank you, Doc. 